Okay, God bless. We're now going to be looking a little bit about uh, the city of God. In, in session 11, we, we spoke about how there was a unique aspect to our living hope, which included the descendants, the, the believing descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Also included in that was that they would inherit the land of Israel uh, that was outlined in the Old Testament, the, the boundaries of it, and, uh, and that David would end up being their king and that the 12 apostles would be over the 12 tribes of Israel. In addition to the things that we looked at in, the, in that session, I want to focus now on the city of Jerusalem and the temple as it's going to be in the future in the millennial kingdom. There are extraordinary things said about the city of God, like in Psalm 132, verses 13 and 14, it says, For Yahweh has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. That's quite a statement. Yahweh has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. That's, that's quite something for Yahweh to say that. You have to go all the way to the end of the Bible to see that the new Jerusalem will come down and then God will be among his people here in the new Jerusalem here on earth. So there is this great love that he has for this city. It says in Psalm 78, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which Yahweh loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which Yahweh has founded forever. In 87, 2 and 3, Yahweh loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Salah. Again, consider what I say. So you can see that how God speaks of this place, this city, Jerusalem. Far cry from the way it has been and is today, but in the future, it will be God's place of abode. The first mention of the city is in Genesis chapter 14, in verse 18. This is when they had the, that war and Abraham uh, succeeded in bringing Lot back. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God, most high. Psalm 70, 76, too, shows that Salem and Jerusalem, they are the same place. Melchizedek, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness or righteous king. Psalm 110 and Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 reveal to us that Melchizedek was and is a type for Jesus, the Messiah. So the first mention of the city is a type for Jesus in the age to come. He will be the righteous king ruling from Jerusalem, ruling the world from there. And Jesus himself will be the priest, the high priest of God, and the king ruling from Jerusalem. Other than Jesus, there was never anyone other than Melchizedek, who was both king of Jerusalem and the high, the high priest of the Most High God, or priest of the Most High God. So that first ends up being just like the last will be when Jesus comes back. That's, again, not unusual. The Hebrew word for Jerusalem can literally mean pointing the way to completeness. However, most often it's thought of to mean the city of peace. The Hebrew word Salem comes from, uh, the, the, the word Salem comes from the Hebrew word Shalom. And shalom, 
Again, most people translate it as peace, but the word shalom has a lot more meaning to it than just peace. It means completeness, soundness, and welfare. Shalom is very similar to the word sozo that's used in the New Testament, meaning salvation and completeness and wholeness. So the city of Jerusalem has a unique name in that its name is Jerusalem. However, it has many other names that are listed in the scriptures. I have them in your notes. There's quite a few of them. Zion, the city of David, the city of the great king, the holy city, the city of God, the city of Yahweh, the city of Yahweh of hosts, the city of righteousness, the holy mountain. That's a unique one. The holy mountain. I want to bring your attention to that one. It's called that quite often. The one that stands out about this is, is in Ezekiel 28:14. I had mentioned this in a previous se session. This is the area in the scripture that talks about the cherubim who rebelled against God and ended up becoming Satan. He was in the holy mountain. That's what it says in Ezekiel 28. It's my belief that the, the topography of Israel, the topography of the world has changed after the flood. But initially, wherever Jerusalem was at that time, that holy mountain was where I think the Garden of Eden was. It's also, it's called the city of truth, the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth, the Lord of righteousness, Yahweh is there, the throne of Yahweh, Ariel. And then in Revelation, it's, not, it's given a couple of names that are not very flattering, Sodom and Egypt and Babylon. But then finally, it's, you know, it's going to end up being the new Jerusalem. So you can, if you choose to, you can look up all of those different places where it has those names. In Exodus 15, it says, you will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Yahweh, which you have made for your dwelling. It's a place that was made for his dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Yahweh shall reign forever and ever. Jerusalem, very, very significant. Before Israel entered the promised land, God told them that there would be a place that he wanted to be identified as his specific location. But in the book of Deuteronomy, he didn't tell them the name of the place. He just told them what he wanted them to do there. And again, I've listed this in your notes. He gives them very specific instructions. He didn't tell them the location. I'm not sure why. Maybe he didn't want them fighting over it or whatever. It doesn't tell me why, so no sense in guessing. Uh, but he did tell them what would be done there. Yahweh chose this place to be his place. This is where they do the offerings, the Passover. They would rejoice in this place. They would carry out the three special feasts. The high priest judgments would take place there. The priests and the Levites would minister there. And every seven years, the law was to be read to all of Israel from this place. Now take a look in your Bible at Joshua chapter 10, please. Joshua chapter 10. This is uh, written, of course, Joshua is the one that led Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. Joshua's name is from the Hebrew, uh, is this identical as the name Jesus is from the Greek. Jesus and Joshua are the same names. One translated Joshua, one translated Jesus. And in this 10th chapter, we'll see some extraordinary things that are a type for what will happen at the end of the age. Now it came about when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly destroyed it just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were within their land. So this 
Adonai Zedek had heard about what Israel had done. Remember, Israel crossed over the Red Sea. They came in and they first took over Jericho. The walls of Jericho came falling down. And then they began to uh, systematically conquer all of the different city-states that were in, in the promised land, the land that Yahweh had promised to them. So this guy hears about it, and he's frightened. He's nervous. The king of Jerusalem, this is, because this is before it was taken in, as God's holy place. So he, verse 2, he feared greatly. And uh, verse 3 says, Therefore Adonai Zedok, king of Jerusalem, sent word to four other kings to join in league with him to fight against Israel being led by Joshua. This, this king, this Adonai Zedok, means Lord of Righteousness. That's what that word means. Lord Adonai is Lord. Zedok is Righteousness. Lord of Righteousness. This king of Jerusalem is a, not a type for Jesus. He's a type for the Antichrist. This is before this city has been claimed as God's city. He's a type for the beast. He's gathering, he's rallying other kings to fight against Joshua, Jesus, leading the children of Israel into the promised land. You can see how this is a type for the end times. And um, his intention is to destroy Israel and to get rid of them. The Lord of Righteousness... But that won't happen because the Lord of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, is going to end up destroying him. So in, in verse 7, so Joshua, Joshua went up. So he gathers these kingdoms together, these kings together, the four of them. So now there's five of them. They're going to fight against Gibeon. And in uh, verse 7, so Joshua went up to, to Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the valiant warriors... And Yahweh said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal. And, the, and Yahweh confounded them before Israel, and he slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and pursued them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as these two other places. And they fled from before Israel while they were on the descent from Beth Horon. The Lord threw large stones from heaven on them for the, that, so that many more would die from the hailstones than from the sons of Israel who killed them with the swords. So <laughs> more than were killed with the sword were killed with hailstones. This is also in the book of Revelation. Remember this 100-pound hailstone. Then Joshua, verse 12, Then Joshua, of course is Jesus, spoke to Yahweh in the, day, in the day when Yahweh delivered up the Amorites from before the sons of Israel and said to him in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon. O moon, in the valley of Ajalon, and the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. And it is written in the book of Jasser, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like that before or after, when the Lord listened to the voice of the man, for Yahweh fought for Israel. Then Joshua and all the of Israel with him returned to the camp at Gilgad. What a wonderful example of exactly what's going to happen when Christ comes back. Instead of it being Joshua, it's going to be Jesus. And uh, they're, they're, again, the, the, the Antichrist who is going to be headquartered, the beast who is headquartered in Jerusalem, functioning out of the temple... He's going to rally all the kings of the world to come up against Jesus. And this is what we call Armageddon. 
not going to go good for them at Armageddon, just as it didn't go good for them in this time. You see, it's a, a miniature example of the end times. In Joshua 15, 63, it says, Now as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, I'm moving on. They go in, Joshua and the Israelites, they, they conquer these five kingdoms, they had conquered these other, and they go on and they take many of the locations that Yahweh told them would be theirs in the land of Canaan. However, the one place they didn't take was Jerusalem, which was then owned or run or lived, the, the Jebusites lived there. I don't think it's ironic. I think it's, quite, it's, it's pathetic that of everything that they took, they took everything that was around it except for the one place that God wanted as his holy city. Sad. In Joshua, now as far as the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites lived with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day, the day of the writing of Joshua. In Judges, it says in verse, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, Now Yahweh was with Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had iron chariots. They gave Hebron to Caleb, and Moses had promised and they drove out from there the three sons of Anak. The sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem. So all the time of that generation with Joshua, going into the period of the time of Judges, which is over 400 years, they did not take the city that God wanted as his city. They lived among the people of Benjamin. That's the tribe that got that area. So uh, it's kind of, it's sad, isn't it? Uh, but then we see David finally comes on the scene. When David is made the king of the United Kingdom, he, his very first act was to establish Jerusalem as his capital city, the city of God. That was the very first thing he did as king. He went in, and I guess he figured out how to get rid of the Jebusites and took over Jerusalem. The second act as the king, he brought back the ark. He brought in the ark. He didn't bring it back. He brought in the ark of the covenant that was in the tabernacle and set it up in Jerusalem so that Jerusalem could be God's holy place. Prior, now, we know that after, after David, things started to go south, even with Solomon. With the time, well, I should, before we move on, with the time of, of David, it was Israel at its highest. This is when Zion, it was referred to as Zion. This is when Israel were at their best. They had, the, they had the Ark of the Covenant there, the worship of Yahweh. It was like Yahweh wanted it to be. Early in the morning, late at night, thousands of, of people would be singing praises to Yahweh. They would wake up with praises to Yahweh. They would go to sleep with praises to Yahweh. It was Jerusalem and at its best and Israel at its best. But the next generation, Solomon, he brought in wealth beyond imagination into the city of Jerusalem. But unfortunately, he also brought in all these other wives. And he started sinning and worshiping other gods. After him, the kingdom was split into two, Israel and Judah, never to be reunited again. Uh, maybe, I guess they consider it maybe in 1948 it was reunited, but it, nothing compared to the land mass that David had acquired. So, uh, and then as time went on, and we've looked in, in, in uh, sessions before, we talked about how bad it was when the, after they built the temple and the, the years went by and the, the destruction of the temple with the Babylonians, the idolatry that went on during the second temple and the third temple. And of course, we saw how Israel, you, instead of keeping uh, Jerusalem and the temple as God's holy place, gave it over to gross immorality. We know that when Jesus went up to the temple and when he went into Jerusalem, remember he went into Jerusalem and he wept over it. 
When he went into the temple, when he first started his ministry, he knocked out all the money changers. Right before the end of his ministry, he did the same. The place was terrible. Now we know, because of our study of 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, we know that in those last seven years, particularly the, uh, the middle of it, the three and a half years, that the beast, also called the little horn, also called the man of destruction, the man of lawlessness, the last world ruler, will be in that holy place and consider himself to be God. And he will be worshipped as a man God in that temple area. How terrible. However, there is an end to it all. Go to Isaiah, please. Isaiah chapter 2. Because Jesus is coming back. He will defeat the beast. He will destroy that temple. He will basically, the beast will have destroyed Jerusalem itself and the, and the temple. And then Jesus will usher in a whole new era. There will be a new Jerusalem. There will be a new temple, not to, be, to fulfill the Mosaic law, but from that temple, Jesus will rule the world. It will be the fifth temple that will be there. And then it says in Isaiah chapter 2, I've got to get there. Now the word, verse 1, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief, as the chief of mountains and will raise above the hills and all the nations will steam to it and many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us concerning his way that he may walk, that we may walk in his path. For the law will go forth from Zion, the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. How blessed will Yahweh be when this finally comes to pass, when our Lord returns. Verse 4, And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many people and will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. How glorious that will be. Chapter 4 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Seven women will take hold of one man. This is during the millennial kingdom. In that day saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our clothes. Only let us be called by your name and take away our reproach. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. And it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When Yahweh has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Then Yahweh will create over the holy area of Mount Zion, over her assemblies, a cloud by day, even smoke and brightness of flaming fire by night. For all the glory will be a canopy. And there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. The beginning part of this chapter seems to be talking about something in, its, in Israel and Jerusalem's immediate future. And then it, it warps into what's going to happen at the very end and how Jerusalem is going to be this holy place as Yahweh always wanted it to be. Look at chapter 24 of Isaiah. Isaiah 24, 18. Then it will be that he who flees, the report of disaster will fall into a pit, and he who climbs out of the pit 
be caught in the snare and the windows above are open and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro from, like a drunkard and it totters like a, sh a shack for its transgression is heavy upon it and it will fall never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high. That would be the spirit beings and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will all, they will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon and will confine and be confined in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. And Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And his glory will be before his elders. There will be, you know, in those last three and a half years, is going to be a turbulent time, a terrible time of God's wrath shortly thereafter when Jesus comes back. But ultimately, the way it ends up is Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. Look at chapter 35, Isaiah 35. Verse 1, the wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Araboth will rejoice and blossom. The Araboth is a desert now, like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. And the glory of Lebanon will be given to it, and the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. And they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage and exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come. He will save you. Verse 5, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth into the wilderness and streams in the Araboth, in the desert. The scorching land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals, its resting place. Grass becomes reeds and rushes. Highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it. It will be for him who walks that way. The fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will there be any vicious beast to go upon it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. The ransom of Yahweh will return and come with shalful with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Chapter 40, yes. Chapter 40. Comfort. O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has been ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of Yahweh's hand double of all of her sins. A voice is calling, clear the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. The voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is as grass, and its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the breath of Yahweh blows upon when the breath of Yahweh blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. 
say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Glory, hallelujah. 52. Isaiah had a lot to say about all this. Isaiah 52. Verse 1, awake, awake, clothe yourselves in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in beautiful garments. We're talking about, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. That's where she is now, but it's not where she's going to be. Thus says Yahweh, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord Yahweh, my people went down at first into Egypt and reside there. Then the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what do I have here, declares Yahweh, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause. Again, Yahweh declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all the day. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up your voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see with their own eyes when Yahweh restores Zion. Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste place of Jerusalem. For Yahweh has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. Verse 18. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta get to the chapter first. <laughs> chapter 60. Isaiah 60. Well, I tell you what, I'll I'll leave you to read the rest of these. They're all as wonderful. And um, let's go to Revelation 21. All these, all that has happened in Jerusalem, all the terrible things for so many, many years. And that what's in her future is not pleasant either when the beast rules there, when he rules the world. But it's all going to come to an end. And once again, what Yahweh has always wanted will become the reality. In, uh, in Revelation 21, you've got to go to the end of the book for that reality to take place. <laughs> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain. The first things are passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these words, faithful and true. Then in verse 10, He carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like costly stone, a stone of crystal clear as jasper. And it goes on to give the description of this great and holy city. It also gives the dimensions of what this millennial kingdom is going to be like and this new kingdom that comes down, the millennial kingdom, then the final age, the new Jerusalem when it comes down. 
where it says it's going to be 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles high, the new city. And it has the, the description of every precious jewel and stone is going to be a part of it. It's going to have streets of transparent gold. You know, it's going to be extraordinary. 1,500, 1500 miles is from here to, to Oklahoma City. 1,500 miles going north and south is from uh, Maine, probably, to Key West. And I'm guessing with that, I mean, it's far away. 1,500 miles high, out of space. <laughs> you know, the, the Empire State Building, which is the tallest building in the United States, it has 102, floor, 102 floors. You know how tall it is? It's 5,280 feet. It's not even a mile. Huh? Oh, 1,453 feet. Thank you, from top to bottom. When I, I, there, the 5,280 feet is what's in a mile. So it's not even a mile up. And we're talking 1,500 miles. It's going to be different. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be glorious. That is the city of God. When then, at that time, all of the, all of the covenant that was made with Abraham will be fulfilled. All of the covenant that was made with David will be fulfilled. All of the covenant that came with Jesus will be filled. The Messianic covenant. At that time, we will live on in eternity. The sooner the better. Okay, God bless.